Welcome to the online meeting of the working group two of the AutoCAM cost action. Uh, as you know, the main objective of this action is to design at a second light policies and at a second control strategies that can efficiently be used to induce specific charge migration dynamics in molecules. This action brings together chemists, physicists, experimentalists and theoreticians from more than 26 countries, facilitating their collaboration. Unfortunately, in the last year, we had to rely mostly on virtual online collaboration. This new situation was slightly easier for the working group too, which handled the theoretical and computational part of the AutoCAM actions activity. As far as I know, the collaboration between our research groups didn't stop. However, it's a pity that we did not have much opportunity of STSMs and on-site visit face-to-face -face discussion. This virtual meeting of the working group two members tries to fill the gap in the personal contacts. We will have the opportunity to know each other's research methods, new ideas and interesting results, almost as in case of an on-site meeting. However, we will miss the conference dinner. Finally, I remind you some technical issues. The audience is kindly asked to keep the microphones muted during the talks. After the talk, if you want to ask questions, please use the raise hands button either from reactions menu or from the participant list. After each session, you will have the opportunity to discuss with the speakers of the session using the Zoom links available in the program of the meetings webpage. Most of the talks I stream also on YouTube for a larger public, so I greet also the audience on that channel. Finally, enjoy the meeting. Now I ask Fernando Martin, the chair of the AtoCam Cost Action, to say a few words. He will chair also the first session of the meeting. Fernando, please. Um, thank you very much, Ladislao, for the introduction. Um, and well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Ladislao and his team for organizing this meeting and for uh, designing the program of this meeting. It, it, I think this is uh, something very important and will help us to keep alive the action during these hard times. Um, well, as Ladislao has said, uh, the purpose of our ATOCAM network is to study how at second science can be used to study problems of chemical interest. And this uh, includes both experimentalists and theoreticians. But as theoreticians, I think we have the responsibility to, to guide experimentalists and to uh, help them to interpret their very complicated measurements. And this meeting is devoted mainly to present theoretical tools that have been developed recently uh, in the framework of our action to meet this uh, goal. I'd like to remind you uh, that uh, uh, the aim of the, uh, of, the, of the cost action is to encourage uh, mobility and contacts between uh, researchers. Unfortunately, mobility nowadays is not an easy thing, and, uh, but I'd like to remember uh, anyway that we have at the disposal of the uh, cost participants our short-term scientific missions that allow to spend some time in a, in a different laboratory just to learn new things just to go on with a, a collaboration or 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 whatever you want i think that this tool is there uh, and although it cannot be used uh, as massively as in normal uh, circumstances. Still, I think that it could be very valuable for some of you. Uh, so I encourage you to consider this possibility, especially in the forthcoming uh, months where uh, the situation all around Europe uh, seems to improve. And the other aspect, important aspect of this cost action is to uh, organize meetings, uh, to uh, encourage contacts between different researchers. And so far, we, I think we are doing very well. We have already our first annual meeting in last September that was held online. 
and uh, we are now uh, having few working group meetings uh, on more specialized topics as this one. So finally, I'd like to, uh, to, to tell you that if you want to uh, benefit from all these tools that uh, our Atokan Action puts at uh, your disposal, you should register in the Atokan website. So please, if you have not done it yet, please do it. Go to the Atokan website, fill your data, and that's it. And then you will be informed about all the developments of the action and you will be able to apply for whatever you think is useful to, uh, to for your research. So please do it. And I extend this invitation to the speakers and chairs uh, of, this, of this meeting. It takes only a couple of minutes to fill the, uh, the uh, uh, registration form. And with this, I, I am done. I, I reiterate my thanks to Ladislao and his team who have worked very hard to, to organize this meeting. And I hope that this meeting will be a successful one for all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fernando. Uh, I think you can continue uh, with the first session. Thank okay, uh, well, it's not yet uh, um, 10, so maybe we can wait uh, two or three minutes. Uh, yeah. But what I can do in the meantime is just to remind the audience a few rules that you already mentioned, but I think they are very important in case somebody log in uh, later. Uh, so during the, uh, the session, uh, please uh, turn off your microphones and cameras. That is very, very important to avoid any disturbance uh, during the talks. Um, also, uh, this will be held in the, in the normal way. I mean, uh, the speakers will have time to uh, deliver their presentations. Uh, and after that, there will be time for questions. The total time uh, given to each speaker is 40 minutes. And so um, the talk should be around 35 minutes. And then we should have like five minutes for questions. It could be a longer time for questions if you want. And the way to ask questions at the end of the, of the talks is by raising your virtual hands in the Zoom. Uh, so uh, these you can do it in case you are not familiar with Zoom. You can do it uh, depending on the version of Zoom you have. But in some versions, there is uh, a link in the bottom of your screen that is called Reactions. And you click there, you will see uh, different icons. And one of them is uh, a hand, a raising hand. So please click this icon to raise your hand whenever you want to uh, ask questions. And I will, at the end of the talk, I will um, call you to open your microphone and camera to ask the question. And um, in other versions of Zoom, the link is not in the bottom, it's just in the list of participants. So you open the list of participants and then uh, at the bottom of this list of participants, you may have a link to raise your hand. So please follow this way, otherwise uh, it will be uh, uh, complicated to, um, to develop the, the session in a normal way. So with this, I think uh, we are just in time. So it's my pleasure to, uh, to chair this first session of the working group two uh, meeting. We have a very uh, uh, attractive um, session with Eva Brezinova. Uh, Loic Joubert uh, Doriol and Elke Fashauer. Um, so uh, I pass the, the floor to uh, Eva, who is going to speak about the time dependent to particle reduced density matrix method. Thank you very much, Fernando. I hope you can hear me. Yes, very well. Very good. So first, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about our research here. And I will start sharing my screen. I hope you can see it now in presentation mode. Yes, yes, we can. Great. Okay. 
So, um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to talk here. Uh, although I have to admit, I'm very much looking forward to the next work group meeting where we hopefully can meet in person. So, as Fernando already mentioned, my talk is about the time dependent two particle reduced density matrix method. And one uh, the, uh, a disadvantage of this method is it's a very long name. So, I will use the abbreviation TD to RDM. It's much easier to be remembered. And I will show you what this theory is about, and I will show you our first applications of this theory. We are generally interested in non-equilibrium dynamics with many body systems. So a prototypical example is electrons, for example, in an atom, uh, or maybe also later in a molecule, driven by a strong or a, an ultra short laser pulse. This is the prototypical platform we want to uh, use our theory for. And obviously you all know that if one wants to describe such a thing, theoretically, since this is a strongly driven system beyond linear response, one has to use an explicitly time dependent uh, Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian typically has the form of a sum over one body operators and the pairwise interactions. And then we, of course, write down the time dependent Schrödinger equation. And it doesn't cost much to realize that a direct solution is not possible, except for very small systems. And the reason is the exponential scaling of the numerical effort we have, if we want to really um, solve the full Schrödinger equation. So there are several methods already available to address these questions, but they are very different when it comes to their assessment when, uh, regarding numerical effort and accuracy. So <clears throat> I have grouped them into two groups and just picked one representative. Of course, there are others within each group. So one representative is MCTDHF, uh, which is a wave function based ab initio method. So it explicitly uses a wave function that is then propagated. And it can be made very, very accurate, but of course the numerical effort is also very high because you still have this exponential scaling. On the other hand, there are methods that are based on reduced objects and the most prominent example I would say is time-dependent density functional theory, which is a density-based method. Here the accuracy is quite limited. It depends a little bit um, on the system and also on the functionals that you use. But overall, the accuracy is not very well controlled. But the numerical effort is very small. And therefore, it's also applicable to large and extended systems, like even solids. But we thought there is a huge gap in between. And our aim was to find something that is also polynomially scaling, but more accurate. So we, want to had, we wanted to have a theory that is polynomially scaling, but much more accurate than TDDFT, and maybe close to as accurate as a wave function based methods like method like MCTDHF. And I will show you in the following whether we succeeded or not to find such a theory. So the overview is, I will introduce to you the method and then I will show you first application. So let me start with that. The reduced object we are using is the two particle reduced density matrix. Since we want to avoid this exponential scaling, we have to use some reduced object. And we decided to pick uh, the two particle reduced density matrix for several reasons. One of the reasons is that two particle correlations are then exactly incorporated. And you get this two particle reduced density matrix if you take your full wave function and trace out all but two particles. So imagine you just have two electrons, then of course this would be the full uh, information that you can even have, that would be the full density matrix of the system. And then the dynamics would be described by the Hamiltonian consisting of, I just try to turn off, uh, do you see my, my mouse or do I need to have a laser pointer? I see it. Uh, I see it. Okay, great. Then I will just use my mouse. So the, the, the two particle Hamiltonian consists of uh, two one body operators naturally and the pair interaction. 
And if we would have just this pair, then the equation of motion would be just the von Neumann equation, which is given by this formula here. But of course, we want to go beyond just two electrons. So let's say we have a quite large number of electrons. And of course, each pair interacts with its environment. So this electron interacts with the other one and any other electron. And by this construction already, you see that if we want to now describe the dynamics of the two particular use density matrix, something is missing here in this equation of motion. And this something is the three particular use density matrix, because from this construction, we can already see that three particle correlations are imported for the dynamics of pairs. So this is the part that has been missing before. As such, this is still an exact equation of motion. This equation of motion is one element of the so-called bogolyubov born green kirkwood yvon hierarchy. This is a coupled hierarchy. So the first element is describes the dynamics of the one particular use density matrix. The second element is the one we want to consider now and so on and so forth. And it's only closed for Q, so Q number of particles that you consider equal to N because it is coupled. So if we want to restrict ourselves just to the second element, we have to somehow approximate the three particular use density matrix by a closure. And the rest of the talk will be how to do exactly that. So to find a suitable reconstruction functional of the three particle use density matrix, and then plugging that in is what the time dependent two particle use density matrix will be about. So just to mention, I, I'm afraid the last line you cannot see because it is somehow covered by my task line, but just I will verbalize it. So the scaling of this uh, method is um, to the power of five if you use a grid basis or to the power of seven if you use an orbital basis and linear in time. So we have a polynomial scaling with this theory. So what are the ingredients for a successful approximation or a successful approximate closure? you need to have an accurate reconstruction. You have to make sure that constants of motion are really conserved during time evolution. And then there is one thing we will have to deal with, which is called the end representability problem. And I will talk about it later. Just to give you a feeling about the two particle reduced density matrix, I would like to show you a little bit what um, this uh, how this two particle reduced density matrix looks for a prototypical uh, system like a beryllium atom. So let's just uh, look at um, its structural properties. So this is the two particle reduced um, density matrix. Well, it's not a matrix anymore because we just have used the diagonal. So it's a two particle distribution as a function of the two radial uh, components. And what you can already see here is the trace of the 1s shell, which is occupied by two electrons. This is a combination of 1s and 2s. And um, it is quite strongly enhanced because the number of pairs you can have is double compared to the 1s shell or the 2s shell, so along the diagonal, where you can just have one pair. So up down along the diagonal, 1s and 2s. And if you can, if you have strongly different radii and you combine 1s and 2s, you have four pairs altogether. So therefore these wings are enhanced. So this is the 1s shell and this is the 2s shell with its pairs. This is the full two particle distribution. But I can show you now explicitly two particle correlations. And how do I get them? I can always separate this two particle distribution into one component. This is the Hartree-Fock component that I would get if I had independent particles that are non-interacting. So just coming from a Slater determinant, one can construct this component from the one particle reuse density matrix, plus something that cannot be constructed from the one particle reuse density matrix. And this is exactly the two particle 
uh, cumulant that measures correlations. And what you can immediately see here is the so-called correlation hole. So the particles do not do not like to sit on the same shell. The one S, the one S shell here, and the two S shell here get a reduced two-particle distribution. So I have already mentioned that if we have the two-particle reuse density matrix at the disposal, two-particle correlations are fully incorporated. And I will now explain to you this in a little bit more pictorial way by a diagrammatic expansion. And I will use diagram diagrams that resemble very much those that are used for Green's functions. But please bear in mind that these are not Green's functions, but density matrices, so something like an equal time limit of a Green's function. But because people are more familiar to these arrows um, from Green's function theories, I just have used the same pictures here. So this is what is all incorporated in the two particle reduced density matrix, namely, again, this component that is just an anti-symmetrized product of two one particle reduced density matrices. And this is exactly this hartree fock component we had before. And then again, here, this cumulant. And the two, this, this cumulant, these two particle correlations are fully included in the two particle reduced density matrix method. If um, we use, the uh, to RDM as the fundamental object. But as I already mentioned, for a closure, we also need the three particle reduced density matrix. So some components, again, are reconstructable by reduced objects. So this is, again, the, let, let's say, trivial, trivial part, which is um, an anti-symmetrized product of three one particle reduced density matrices. And again, this is the hartree fock component. But then there is one component we can construct directly if we have the cumulant at disposal, the two particle cumulant. So these are processes where two particles are correlated and the other one is not correlated. And this one can explicitly write down as an anti-symmetrized product of the two particle cumulant and a three part uh, and a one particle reduced density matrix for the third third particle. And then there is something that is not reconstructable a priori from the two particle reuse density matrix, namely the three particle cumulant that measures uh, real three particle correlations. So one approximation known from lit literature is just neglecting these three particle correlations altogether and use this as a reconstruction functional for the three particle reduced density matrix. This is then called the Valdemoro reconstruction. We had the experience that this is not a sufficiently good reconstruction and we had to go beyond that. So we had to approximate this three particle uh, cumulant and we did that by this sequence of two particle correlations that can also be written down using the two particle cumulant. And this is known in literature as the Nakatsuchi Yasuda reconstruction. So this is the reconstruction that we have ultimately used. Now, one thing that is very important and that has hindered previous attempts of um, establishing or using the time dependent two particle use density matrix is the following observation. Of course, conserved quantities should be conserved during time propagation. So if you have a Hamiltonian that is not explicitly time dependent, energy should be conserved, for example. Um, but uh, also, for example, spin degrees of freedom. If you drive your atom with a laser, spin is a conserved quantity. And also, the uh, individual, the hierarchy of these equations should be consistent. So if we take our two particle reuse density matrix, the equation of motion for it, and we trace out one particle, we should consistently arrive at the correct equation of motion for the one particle reuse density matrix. So let's see whether this is fulfilled by our reconstruction function. So for example, energy conservation, but also this consistency between the hierarchies, between the first and the second, um, uh, requires that the three particle reduced density matrix 
correctly contracts upon tracing out the third particle to the two particle reuse density matrix. So any reconstruction function we use here should have this property. And of course, this is trivially fulfilled for the exact three RDM, so three particle reuse density matrix, but it is not fulfilled by any of the so far mentioned reconstructions. And we came up with a solution for that problem, namely by calculating this defect that is just the difference between the trace and the full two particle reuse density matrix. And then it turns out one can correct any uh, reconstruction functional by a component of the three particle reuse density matrix that exactly contains this defect. So this is a component that has a vanishing cumulant but can be constructed from its, um, from its contractions and therefore uh, produces a three particle reuse density matrix that exactly has these correct contraction properties. So we use here the unitary decomposition and if you want to know more of this technical de detail, I can uh, discuss it with you later. But just let me show you how important this contraction consistency is. So for that, we use as a benchmark method MCTDHF and we have propagated beryllium in a quite strong laser field driven by uh, an um, yeah, IR laser field of quite high intensity. And what we do here is just to benchmark how important contraction consistency is for this reconstruction, we calculate in parallel MCTDHF and um, for each time step, we compute uh, the correct three particle reuse density matrix and the reconstructed one, including this contraction consistency. And just look at the con reconstruction error. So the difference between the, the difference between the full um, three particle reuse density matrix and the reconstructed one. And the two curves show you with and without contraction consistency. So this is the reconstruction error. We have just used the Hilbert-Schmidt norm for that as a function of time. And this is this Nakatsuji-Yasuda reconstruction functional. So without contraction consistency, this is the error of it. And now if we apply contraction consistency, you see that the error decreases by an order of magnitude. So this was very important for for this closure of the equations of motion. So overall the reconstruction is improved and this is true for any or applicable for any reconstruction function. Now to this unrepresentability problem that also hindered previous attempts. And just to give you a perspective on that, I will now talk a little bit about ground state problems because the two particle reuse density matrix theory has been first established for um, ground state problems in quantum chemistry. It's uh, quite um, widely used already. And the problem of N representability in principle um, accompanies this method since the 50s. So now I will just talk about ground state problems and then also compare to DFT that you get a feeling for this unrepresentability problem and then I will show you how we had to deal it, uh, deal with it in, in this time dependent framework. So let's talk about a variational ansatz for the two particular use density matrix for um, calculating the ground state of a system. Now you have to know that the, the energy of any system is an exact functional of the two particle reuse density matrix. This is different for densities because there the energy functional is not known, but for the two particle reuse density matrix, the energy functional is exactly known. And the reason is that the Hamiltonians we use contain only pairwise interactions and therefore the energy functional is an exactly known functional of the two particle reuse density matrix. So already in the 50s, people realized that and said, okay, then let's use this known energy functional and do a variational ansatz to determine the ground state energy of any quantum system. 
And they used an ANSATS for the two particle reduced density matrix. It was very reasonable. Of course, the reduced density, any reduced density matrix has to be Hermitian. And since we have fermions, it has to be anti symmetric. It has to be positive semi definite. So the eigenvalues have to be uh, larger or equal to zero. And with this ANSATS, people tried by a variational approach to determine the ground state of, of um, multi-electron systems. So the idea was we start with a test two-particle reduced density matrix and then iteratively we minimize the energy and obtain then the correct two-particle reduced density matrix of the ground state. But what people had to figure out is that the, the energy they obtain is much smaller than the exact ground state. Now, that um, might surprise you because if you um, remember how variational um, methods usually work, you obtain usually an upper bound for the energy. And the reason for that is that usually the variational approach is done within wave functions. So in explicitly in the Hilbert space. And there, of course, the um, well-defined minimum is just the ground state wave function. But here it seems by minimizing this energy just by these restrictions, we have left the Hilbert space because otherwise we would never reach an energy that is smaller than the real ground state energy. So this is what the, the unrepresentability problem is about. These conditions that I have mentioned before, Hermitian antisymmetric positive semi-definite, are not enough to guarantee the correct quantum statistics. That is to guarantee that we have probed only the two particle reduced density matrices to which actually a fermionic wave function belongs. So uh, just to compare the two methods, uh, the two RDM and a density functional theory, uh, since I guess that some of you are very familiar with density functional theory, I want to just show the similarities and but also the, the differences. So as I have mentioned already, the energy is a non-functional of the two RDM. This is not the case for the energy functional in DFT. So this is one advantage of the two RDM, but one disadvantage of DFT. Um, but now comes the unrepresentability problem. The unrepresentability problem for the two RDM is uh, solved. I've put that under um, quotation marks because it's only implicitly solved. There is a constructive method to find all necessary conditions, but um, uh, unluckily for us, there is an infinite number of them. And in any um, real application, you, of course, have to restrict yourself to a small number of, of necessary conditions that can be incorporated. And incorporating these few necessary conditions, this is what is then called purification. For densities, the ensemble and representability problem is solved. I want to point out here the word ensemble, that is the mapping between a density matrix and the density, because it just requires that the eigenvalues of the one particular use density matrix must be within zero and one. Now, what about this mapping between wave functions and um, the two particle reduced density matrix, there is a theorem, it's called Rosina's theorem for the ground state, that there is a bijective mapping between the wave function of the ground state and the two particle reduced density matrix for the ground state. And this is again a little bit different for the density because there is not a bijective mapping. There is one wave function that maps to the one particle reduced density matrix. And if I know the Hamiltonian, I can say this is exactly the wave function that I'm interested in. But there are other wave functions. For example, Slater determinants can be constructed that map exactly to the same uh, one particle reduced uh, density matrix or density. And this is, in fact, uh, used in the Kohn-Sham answers. So there is no contradiction to the holmberg cohn theorem. So I mentioned Rosina's theorem already. There, there is this bijective mapping between the many body wave function and the two particle reduced density matrix. So in principle, an exact reconstruction functional should exist due to this bijective mapping. 
we want to now uh, perform a time dependent propagation of the two particle reuse density matrix. So it would be good to know whether this bijective mapping and therefore also an existence of a reconstruction functional is in principle guaranteed by something like an equivalent of the runge gross theorem for the two particle reuse density matrix. But this is an unsolved problem. So there, um, the, an equivalent of the runge gross theorem has not been found yet. But let's not get um, stuck by um, some not yet solved existence theorems and just move on and look what uh, happens. Unfortunately, this unrepresentability problem tends to jump into our faces as soon as we try to propagate the two particle reuse density matrix with a reconstruction function of the three particle reuse density matrix. I have to say it's not always the case. I will show you later applications where we did not have this problem because the reconstruction function was so accurate for that specific problem. But if it is not uh, accurate enough, we face the following. So one necessary condition is that the probability to find a pair in some two particle state always has to be larger than a zero. So the positive semi-definiteness of the two particle reuse density matrix has to be guaranteed and, and the eigenvalues have to be larger than zero. But sometimes what we see is if we just propagate what I show you here are the eigenvalues of the two particle reuse density matrix as a function of time. And this was again beryllium driven by a strong IR field. And I plot you here the largest and the smallest eigenvalue. And at some point you can um, see that the largest eigenvalue gets infinite and the smallest eigenvalue gets negative and negative infinite. And at this, this point when this eigenvalue becomes sufficiently negative, the equations of motion are simply unstable. And this instability is due to this violation of unrepresentability. But we managed to cure this problem by the following. Namely, what we do is, and empirically we have realized that it's enough to incorporate just two necessary and representability conditions, namely the positive semi-definiteness of the two RDM and the two-hole RDM. So the pictorial picture we have is that if I imagine the space of, of the two particle reuse density matrices that belong to a wave function as, as this space, it definitely looks different, but just for the sake of having a picture. And this would be the exact dynamics, the reconstructed or approximate dynamics sometimes moves us above this space or beyond this space. And by applying on the fly this purification where we guarantee that the two RDM and the two whole RDM become positive semi-definite again, it brings us close again to this exact dynamics. And with that, we can stabilize the equations of motion for a sufficiently long time. So that brings me to the applications. And what I will talk about are applications to high harmonic generation. So as you all know, high harmonic generation is a strong field effect where in the 80s it has been observed that the response of an atom to a strong field gives rise to this plateau of, um, of, of photonic energies that come out of, of this target that cannot be explained by perturbative um, by, by a perturbative ansatz. And the explanation uh, that is very intuitive is the three-step model that relies on three steps, on ionization, laser acceleration, and then radiative recombination. In our numerics, I will now show you explicitly results for neon. So neon driven by a strong IR field of 10 to the power of 15 and 800 nanomet uh, nanometer wavelengths. So for us in our numerics, um, the three-step model is not explicitly, uh, explicitly uh, obvious. For us, it's just a shaking electron density. I will show you this slide again, that you see this electron density shaking and this accelerated electron density produces then this radiation. And we calculate this radiation just using the 
um, well-known LAMA formula. And in the following, I will now show you the results for neon, so the high harmonics, uh, the yield of high harmonics as a function of the harmonic order. And I will compare the two particle, the time dependent two particle use density matrix method with MCTDHF, which we have used as benchmark. So in the, 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 the theory was accurate for in the sense that we have we had enough orbitals that it was numerically converged. So these are kind of the exact results. And then I will compare to time-dependent Hartree-Fock and time-dependent DFT. Uh, the time-dependent DFT version we have used was LDA with uh, the VWN correlation function. And this is the high harmonic spectrum. So there is a gray curve, this is time-dependent Hartree-Fock, a blue curve, this is time-dependent DFT. MCTDHF you almost cannot see because it is practically exactly covered by the time-dependent to RDM method. So our method is really very accurate, at least for these systems. Uh, but let's um, try to understand a little bit more where these discrepancies come from especially those of TDDFD and TDHF. And for that, we go back actually to the three-step model because it can guide, um, guide numerical results or the interpretation of numerical results. So in this three-step model, the harmonic yield is proportional to this ionization rate. And then we have these classical trajectories that then recombine back with the parent atom and the recombination probability, which we have approximated by the ground state occupation probability. And if you look at these observables, um, the ionization rate as a function of time, what you see here below are the relevant classical trajectories, then it um, becomes obvious that TDDFT largely overestimates ionization and TDHF underestimates it. And the, um, for, the for the recombination probability, it's the other way around, but the recombination probability is very large. So in principle, almost one for both, um, or for, for, all, for all the applied theories. So the most important effect here is actually the ionization rate. And the ionization rate being um, strongly um, uh, strongly, um, so uh, TD, TDDFT predicts a much stronger ionization rate than all other theories, and therefore TDDFT is so much off here. So let's discuss maybe also a case where we looked at beryllium, because there also the effect of two particle ionization comes into play. And again, the TDDFT and TDHF approaches are practically completely off and MCTDHF and time dependent to RDM fit extremely well together. So here one can understand this overestimating uh, the plateau region again by looking at the ionization rate and the ground state uh, or the recombination probability and the trend is um, exactly the trend that you see here, namely that both overestimate um, the plateau can be ex explained by both overestimating the ionization rate, but also uh, the recombination probability. But one can do here more. So let's look at this spectrum, the time dependent to RDM spectrum, and I will just show you this because MCTDHF looks in principle exactly similar, and then compare to single active electron calculations. And I have two of them. I have one single active electron calculation where I have used an ionization potential that corresponds to beryllium and one that corresponds to beryllium plus. So Ultimately, that would be an electron that comes back to a parent um, atom where actually two electrons are missing. And here in this region, I think the single active electron approximation for beryllium plus fits very well, whereas here it's opposite. The single active electron calculation just for beryllium fits very well. So well, how can we explain that? And the explanation is simply the following, that in this region, the electrons have been ionized at the largest laser peak, and then they recombine 
through this smaller uh, following laser peak. So therefore they land just between 10 and the 10th and the 30th harmonics. But if you look at the two particle ionization probability, you can really see that in this region, it is strongly enhanced. So therefore this peak really comes from the electron recombining with a beryllium two plus atom and not just a beryllium plus atom. And our theory can nicely reproduce all of that. So one single active electron calculation will not give you the correct answer, but our theory can really deal both with single as well as two particle ionizations. So uh, with that, I would like to conclude. I have shown you that we have developed a new accurate time dependent quantum many body approach that is called time dependent two particle reuse density matrix theory. It is suitable for the non perturbative um, treatment of strong field physics and it has a polynomial scaling with particle number. And what we want to do next is further develop this theory because one can do even more, one can use even finer reconstruction functionals. Also with the purification, we want to uh, develop further approaches that make it maybe more efficient and uh, more accurate. And our final goal will definitely be to apply this to larger systems, not only atoms, but maybe even extended systems and investigate all the correlation effects that partly have been neglected in strong field and at the second physics. And with that, I would like to thank my collaborators, especially Fabian Lackner and Stefan Donza, uh, two students that worked on on this theory together with me, Joachim Buchdorfer and Takeshi Sato and Kenichi Ishikawa, who have given us uh, their MCTDHF code as, at disposal with which we have calculated all the benchmarks. And I would like to end by thanking you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, uh, Eva, for this very interesting talk. So we have now uh, time for questions. So I see already uh, a hand. Uh, Elke Fashauer, uh, you can ask your question. Hi, Eva, and thank you for the very nice talk. And I, I guess I, I, I applaud to you uh, on behalf of uh, everybody else. Um, could you go back to the slide that you call construction consistency? Yes, so there, yeah. That's the next one. This one, um, the two curves that you have, mm -hmm. uh, they look like they follow the same path. So um, do you think there is a systematic error that you have in these two approxi approximations? And do you have an idea what that is? So that's a very good observation. It also striked us, of course, that these curves just look shifted. And uh, we don't have uh, um, a, a good uh, answer for your question, actually. So what we observe is that these, uh, what we do in this contraction consistency is, um, maybe I, I, I should maybe talk a little bit more uh, what, what is part of this contraction consistency. So what we use is a so-called unitary decomposition. And this unitary decomposition tells you that every matrix that you have can be divided into one part that has non-vanishing traces and one part that is completely trace-free. And this part that has non-vanishing traces can be exactly reconstructed. There is a formula for that by the contractions of this matrix. So what is left is the part that has no contractions. And what we obviously in our reconstruction functionals miss, even with contraction consistency, is the part of the three particle cumulant that has no traces. So the three particle cumulant has a part that is not trace free that we incorporate, but it has also one part that is traceless. And this is the error. And it also strikes us, but we don't have a good answer for that. Why this traceless, um, why this, the, the part of the three particle cumulant that has non-vanishing traces just leads to an overall 
almost she, uh, so an overall like a factorial reduction of the error. Um, I, I cannot tell you any mathematical reason why that should be the case. But it's really an empirical observation that, that um, this reconstruction error gets reduced by about an order of magnitude or even more. Uh, and uh, the, these fluctuations that we see on top of it are almost the same for both in both cases. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I see uh, another hand, uh, Loïc Dubert Doriol, ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the, the talk that was very pedagogical. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Uh, my question is related to uh, the breaking of the positivity of the, the, the matrix that you have. And you were saying that at some point, uh, one eigenvalue becomes negative and then the whole thing diverges basically, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have any idea of what is the uh, reason for that? I would think about something like a division by zero or something like that uh, is the case. And um, then a second question related to that is uh, why not maybe to use an ansatz of uh, like, let's say the Scholesky decomposition of the matrix instead of the matrix itself to ensure positivity. Okay, uh, so the, the instabilities that we see, and this is again a little bit um, empirical, and uh, we were not the only one that saw it. Uh, this, um, so it, it seems that these equations of motion contain a, 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 a feedback that leads to uh, negative eigenvalues getting more and more negative. So this feedback mechanism is um, really somehow intrinsically built into these equations as soon as you start to reconstruct your three particle reduced density matrix. This is such a general observation that um, there might be again some deep mathematical reason for that. We just have empirically and not just us, but uh, all everyone that tries to, to propagate uh, two particle reduced density matrix. We have just empirically noticed that any tiny negative eigenvalue of this density matrix gets enhanced. Um, and uh, the, 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 the eigenvalues in principle really directly, so if you write down the uh, equations of motion just for the eigenvalues, they really directly couple only to the part that contains the three particle cumulant or the three particle, um, the three particle used density matrix. And it seems that, that any tiny error there uh, really um, enhances itself. So it's, it's a little bit, um, along the lines of the principle of conservation of misery, because if we did not have that problem and if we just could propagate without instabilities, then this this um, yeah would be would be really uh, much. Let's say it's it's a little bit. Uh, I tried to to show this in this comparison between DFT and two RDM. So in DFD, you have the problem of not knowing your uh, energy functional, but your, by construction, your equations of motion are, um, are um, stable because with the Kohn-Sham ansatz, you have made sure that you do not leave the, the, the space of unrepresentable densities. But here we have an energy functional that is in principle uh, exactly known. And also we have a reconstruction of the three particle reduced density matrix and we incorporate all the correlations. But despite these equations of motion being much more accurate than TDDFT, probably with any functional that you can come, with, uh, can come up with, uh, at least in a universal sense, um, we face the problem that these equations of motion tend to enhance errors when it comes to negative eigenvalues. So uh, yeah, one has, one has to do something about preventing these instabilities. And this is really just pushing those eigenvalues again back to zero. And this is what we do. And the other question about uh, this, um, um, uh, the, the decomposition I mean, you mentioned. Yeah. Um, 
I... Do you want me to repeat? Or... Yeah, please, please repeat yeah. because okay. I don't know it, so I cannot tell no, you. No, no, the, the idea would be uh, like in DFT, you are using a set of uh, electronic states, one mm -hmm. particular electronic state to construct the density matrix, and that ensures that everything is positively de uh, defined. Like you don't have negative probabilities. And you could do the same maybe for a matrix, but then somehow the root square of a matrix would be the Scholesky decomposition, right? Mm -hmm. So you can maybe propagate this Scholesky decomposition and then reconstruct this density matrix when you need it. Yeah, OK. And that would ensure the positivity of the matrix. Yeah, I honestly speaking, I haven't thought about that. Uh, it's probably a very good idea, and I will have a look at it. If, if Thank you, you for the maybe... comment. But if you, uh, because I, I developed a method for this, uh, for propagation of such objects. If you want, we can talk about it later, maybe, yeah. or I can give you some reference. Yeah, it would be, um, yeah, I would be very thankful for that. Okay, well, I think uh, uh, there are probably more questions, but uh, we had to move on. And so uh, you want to discuss these issues in more detail, I invite you to join this uh, meet the session, meet the speaker session that, uh, you know, we'll start uh, just after uh, this session. So I invite now, uh, thank you, uh, Eva, again, for the thank nice you. The questions. So now I invite Lo Loic uh, Joubert Doriol uh, to give his talk about uh, from low energy non-adiabatic dynamics to atochemistry. And he's from University Gustave Eiffel, France. Okay, um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I would like to start uh, by thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me. Um, wait a minute, maybe I will switch to the uh, full screen uh, presentation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would like also to mention that uh, I am in fact replacing Fabian Gatti today. He couldn't come, but we have a project on atochemistry together, and I will be talking about uh, how I want to extend my knowledge in low energy non adiabatic dynamics to uh, atochemistry. And so really the target uh, system that I have in mind is for example, this uh, oligopeptide uh, that I think most of you already know. There was a famous experiment done more than 20 years ago on this system. And upon um, uh, light pulse excitation, there is ionization uh, of the molecule and subsequent uh, electronic dynamic. Here it's a whole migration over this oligopeptide. And then this hole will localize on a specific uh, position and lead to fragmentation. And the hope is that maybe one day we can uh, control this uh, system by uh, optimizing the initial light pulse and maybe localize the hole in some other position and lead to other fragmentation. And that hopefully would be what we call uh, atochemistry. Uh, but I am, in fact, a bit far from that, as you will see later in the presentation. And uh, I come more from the community of people working on what I call low energy non adiabatic dynamics, where only few electronic states are involved, the few lowest energy low, uh, electronic states. And usually I take this example of the retinal isomerization to explain uh, what I've been working on. So here we have two electronic states that are represented, the ground and the first excited state. And this reaction is just isomerization from cis form to transform. And this is the first step of the vision process. So it's quite important uh, for uh, biology. And uh, the, the process is uh, happening as follows. Uh, first, there is excitation, for example, from uh, sunlight. And then the system will evolve on the excited state and reach a geometry that is called conical intersection, where the two electronic states have the same energy. And since the coupling between the electronic states is inversely proportional to the energy difference, then the coupling tends to infinity at conical intersections. And when the wave packet reaches this region, it can uh, de-excite to the ground state without emitting a photon, and then continue and evolve towards the uh, product. So here, a key feature is that uh, there is this object that I call the conical intersection, and maybe most of you are already familiar with that, and it will be a central um, object in, uh, in a part of my presentation. So how to uh, run the simulation of such a molecular system? Well, we, we would like to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, so with the nuclear kinetic energy, electronic uh, Hamiltonian, and here maybe a time-dependent 
uh, term that would account for the uh, light uh, pulse. Uh, the first thing we can do to uh, reduce the complexity of this problem is by choosing a well-suited uh, electronic basis. And since we are working on the lowest electronic states, uh, very quickly you can think that maybe the adiabatic states are the best ones because they uh, basically minimize the um, the uh, electro the energy of the electronic states by diagonalizing the electronic uh, Hamiltonian, and then we obtain these uh, states that depend on the nuclear degrees of freedom because this is parameterized here by the nuclear degrees of freedom. And uh, then we project our total wave function on these states, and we obtain then a linear combination of products of adiabatic states and another term that is the nuclear wave function that evolves uh, on each of these electronic states. And this comes, in fact, from the projection of the total wave function on the adiabatic states. So since we have only two electronic states in this process, we can just truncate this sum uh, up to two, basically. And then we reduced already the problem by a really a huge amount uh, for in terms of um, degrees of freedom, because we replaced all the electronic degrees of freedom by only two uh, discrete uh, indices, basically. But we are left with all the nuclei. And as you already know, this is called the curse of the diamond trinity, uh, quantum methods uh, scale uh, exponentially. And here, let's say we use a grid uh, with 10 points per dimension. We would need this huge number of points just to represent the wave function, which is completely impossible uh, as for now. Uh, so there are different ways around this curse of the dimensionality. There is, uh, for example, the MCTDH method that can be used for the nuclei, and I will talk about that in the, the second part of my talk. But also we can think about using uh, decomposition of this nuclear wave packet using Gaussians. And the reason uh, why this uh, using Gaussians uh, can in fact work is the following, is that we are um, interested in processes that are ultra fast. And on this time scale, we, we hope that the nuclear wave packet remains rather, um, rather localized. And therefore, the Gaussian wave packets are well suited to represent such a wave packet. Furthermore, the Gaussians can be parametrized by their, uh, the position of their center and a momenta if we uh, make them evolve in time. And therefore, they will follow somehow one dimensional trajectories, each of them. So we are replacing these multi dimensional grids by a bunch of one dimensional trajectories, and hopefully, those trajectories won't scale, like their number won't scale exponentially. Then we expand our nuclear part in this basis, and we still have to calculate the adiabatic states, but that can be done. Uh, from electronic structure packages and even on the fly. So we don't need any model here uh, uh, a priori. Uh, to obtain the dynamics of, uh, I mean, the time dependent evolution of such an ansatz, we are using the uh, time dependent variational principle. And here I am using, in fact, the stationary action where we define such an action here. And when we make it stationary, it leads to this, uh, oops, sorry, it leads to this. Uh, extra condition. Uh, and when we plug our ansatz in this condition, we obtain the equations of motion for all the parameters that appear in our ansatz. So for example, these coefficients and also the parameters. And for example, for the expansion coefficients, the uh, equation of motion is actually quite simple. It looks just like the Schrodinger equation, but for a non-orthonormal basis that is time dependent. So we have these extra terms, but it's quite simple. For the parameters, it can be more complicated, but this can be simplified by just uh, using classical trajectories for uh, the motion of the Gaussian center. And that doesn't spoil the fact that all the approach is uh, really fully quantum at the end, because uh, if we in the first step propagate uh, or evolve all these parameters, then in the second step, we can reconstruct all these Gaussians using these trajectories and we will use this time dependent basis that if uh, uh, we uh, use a lot of them and we take the limit of an infinite basis set, we would still recover the exact solution for the Schrodinger equation. So when we plug uh, our ansatz with this time dependent basis, even though it's not optimal, it still gives back a variational approximation to the total molecular wave function. 
And with this approach, you can really uh, attack problems with very large molecular systems. For example, with the ab initial multiple spawning method, the retinal was uh, modeled here in real time. Uh, also, with the multi-configuration Aronfest method here, the energy transfer between these two dendrimers was also studied. And I think you will agree with me that these uh, systems are uh, rather large. Uh, but what I want to show you now is that this uh, representation using the adiabatic states has problems. And I think you already know about it. But what you may not know is how a simple change in the parametrization can solve these problems. And uh, the first problem I want to show you here is uh, the singularity of uh, many terms in the uh, molecular Hamiltonian in the adiabatic representation. And comes from this matrix here that uh, here is represented for two states. It's the non-adiabatic coupling matrix. And all these terms comes from the fact that the nuclear kinetic energy acts on the electronic states that depend on a big R here, the nuclear coordinates. And of diagonal terms here are in fact the non-adiabatic couplings that are already mentioned at the beginning of this talk. And uh, yeah, they tend to infinite to infinity at the conical intersection. But they are not that uh, big of a problem because uh, when you integrate them over the Gaussian basis for the nuclei, they give back finite number. So we can really do the simulation with uh, including those terms. It doesn't uh, really pose any problem. What is more problematic is this term, also called the diagonal bond Oppenheimer correction. This uh, is are in fact the diagonal term here. And they also tend to infinity uh, because they are divided by the energy, but squared this time. And since they are on the diagonal, they look like potential terms. So it's like if the wave packets, let's say after uh, uh, an excitation to the upper state, will go to the conical intersection, and then it will hit this infinite wall at the conical intersection. Uh, you may wonder what will be the dynamics of such, uh, such a system with such a potential. But in fact, you cannot even include this term because integration of a Gaussian functions gives infinities. Uh, so this term is non-integrable for Gaussians, and you can really not include it in your simulations. You really have to overlook it, and it's a necessary uh, but uh, completely arbitrary approximation that you cannot really control. The second difficulty that can appear in the adiabatic representation is related to the geometric phase uh, that is attached to the electronic states. So just to give you words on what it is, uh, it appears when you transport your solution of the electronic Schrodinger equation continuously around the conical intersection, and you come back at the very same position, then your wave function acquires a minus sign. So it means that there are two possible solutions at the very same nuclear geometry that are continuously connected, but they are different. And this type of functions are called double-valued functions. It's like if they are living on this Mobius strip. You go around once and you change the side, and you have to go around twice to recover the original state. But now what's the implication of the nuclear part? We know that the electronic state is double-valued, but the nuclear part is also double-valued because it's coming from the, the projection of the total wave function on the electronic adiabatic states. So in this integral, we have also double-valued quantities. And uh, overlooking the uh, geometric phase can lead to very wrong dynamics as I studied. For example, in low energy dynamics, the wave packet can split, for example, and go around the conical intersection. Then it should, um, it should acquire different uh, phases, in fact, opposite phases, and then interfere destructively on the other side of the conical intersection. And so we would observe, for example, a nodal line in the density, in the nuclear density. And also, it can prevent from population transfer or this type of stuff. So the role of geometric phase can be important in low energy dynamics, but also when you excite your system and de-excite through the conical intersection. Here, we also uh, shown that uh, uh, not including geometric phase can really reduce the population transfer. In this case, we had a full population transfer with the exact simulation. When we remove the geometric phase, uh, it can be divided by more than two. So it's really problematic in some circumstances when you don't uh, account for this geometric phase. And uh, the problem here is that with our uh, ANSATs uh, for the total wave function, the nuclear part is built uh, as a linear combination of Gaussians. And these Gaussians are single valued functions. 
there, there, are no, there, there is a way to reintroduce the double value nest, but the price is that you would need to build some models for the system. And usually you want to avoid that for the flight dynamics. So really here, there is uh, another uh, necessary approximation that you cannot really control. Uh, the method that I am presenting here can solve both of these problems uh, at once. Uh, first of all, you have to observe that both these problems are um, appearing because the electronic adiabatic state depends on the nuclear degrees of freedom. And if you remove that, you end up with diabetic states. And in fact, it's just a diabetization. And you get rid of uh, all these problems I talked about. One way to do that very simply is to say that, in fact, the electronic states will not depend on the nuclear degrees of freedom, but will depend on something that resembles the nuclear degrees of freedom, but is the parameter uh, so uh, we'll see how it can help later. And this parameter here is the uh, center of uh, the Gaussian uh, wave function. Uh, so we will have several electronic state that will be each attached to their own Gaussians. And the state will be, uh, in fact, uh, calculated or uh, obtained, sorry, uh, as an eigenstate of the electronic Hamiltonian at the Gaussian center. So it's locally adiabatic at the center, but everywhere else it's considered to be diabetic. And this is what, in fact, we call crude adiabatic states. Since this parameter is time dependent, uh, these states are also time dependent. And that's why we call it moving crude adiabatic uh, states, MCA. And it solves both of the problem, as I mentioned, that uh, already um, the uh, big R dependency is removed here. Uh, so we have single valued states and therefore the nuclear part uh, can be single valued without any problem. Uh, as for the singularities, we saw that uh, the singularities were coming from the non-diabetic uh, matrix, uh, non-diabetic coupling matrix, sorry. And that was the result of the action of the nuclear kinetic energy on the electronic state, but here they don't depend on big R. So basically it gives zero. Uh, another advantage of this approach is the following, is that it gets rid um, of uh, potential energy surfaces. And the, the reason why this is interesting is the following. Along the dynamics, you want to evaluate a matrix element over this potential energy surface, but you don't uh, know these potential energy surfaces in the whole space. And you can trace this problem to the fact that uh, you don't solve this electronic Schrodinger equation in the entire uh, nuclear coordinate space. You usually evaluate it only at the Gaussian center or maybe at saddle points. Uh, but then you have to calculate this type of integrals where this integration over big R here uh, runs over the entire space. Since you don't know the expression of the electronic state over the entire space, you need to rely on some approximations or models, like for example, the saddle point approximation or the local harmonic approximation. With the new approach, the integrals that you have to calculate uh, now uh, involves these uh, moving crude adiabatic states and they don't depend on big R, so you can perfectly exchange the two integration here and integrate first on big R. So you get rid completely of potential energy surfaces here, and you can calculate everything exactly. It's just a Gaussian transform of the molecular Hamiltonian. Then if you think about it even more, the electronic states are in fact obtained as a linear combination of product of Gaussians. And all this integral is just a multidimensional Gaussian integration that can be done uh, numerically exactly. So no models are needed and this approach, at least for the model, the, evaluation of the matrix elements is exact. And I tested this, uh, this approach on this uh, small dimension model with one explicit electron so that I really have to obtain either the adiabatic state or the moving crude adiabatic states by diagonalizing the electronic Hamiltonian. And uh, there is also one free proton so that we can look at some non-adiabatic dynamics. And in this model, it's actually uh, quite uh, nice that we have these conical intersections between the first excited and the second excited states. So we indeed uh, can simulate non-adiabatic dynamics. So this is what I did. I placed the initial wave packet on the side of the conical intersection, and I let it evolve uh, in time. And it first hits this conical intersection. And in this region, there are uh, strong non-adiabatic couplings that allow the uh, population to go from the upper state to the lower state. This is what we can see here when we go back to the adiabatic representation. 
which is a signature that indeed uh, this approach can really simulate the uh, non-adiabatic dynamics. And furthermore, I looked at uh, the effect of the geometric phase in the adiabatic representation by observing the, no the appearance of the nodal line in the nuclear wave packet here. So this is a signature that indeed the geometric phase would be accounted for if we go back to the adiabatic representation. And uh, finally, for all the simulations, I didn't use any model. I did all the integrals of all the matrix elements uh, exactly numerically. And the only remaining approximation would be uh, the um, number of basis function that I used. But I ensured that all that uh, all these calculations were converged with respect to the basis size. Um, so uh, as a summary, just for this method, uh, just to repeat what I said, it avoids the singular terms. It automatically accounts for the geometric phase. We can use it to uh, calculate exactly all the matrix elements. And here there is a nice possible interface with quantum chemistry packages, because all what we have to do is just Gaussian integration. And if we combine it with classical trajectories, we can even uh, have this two-step uh, solution of the Schrodinger equation, where we do first uh, quantum classical trajectories in parallel, and then we will reconstruct the basis and solve the quantum uh, dynamical problem in this time-dependent basis. And uh, last point, maybe uh, important one, uh, is that uh, to ensure that the basis is converged, uh, for example, in terms of number of Gaussians, uh, we can use an automatic expansion of this basis. So there are many ways to do that, but I've been working on one way that uh, uh, automatically expand the basis using a variational criteria. So it's completely, it completely fits uh, within the variational uh, approach. Okay, so so far I've been talking about low energy dynamics and how I could solve many of this uh, representation problem for the electronic state using this MCA approach. And now I would like to show you how these ideas can be also useful for atochemistry. When we are uh, interested in atochemistry, we have to uh, give up on having only few electronic state and now we have to deal with a very dense manifold of electronic states. And the reason for that is because the uh, initial ion, ionizing pulse is very short. So let's say it's 1.5 femtosecond. Uh, the energy window uh, for the excitation would be roughly 20 eV. And in this uh, energy region here, we may have like dozens or hundreds of electronic states depending on the molecular system. Um, so here, the first idea is that we can get rid of the adiabatic states because the first idea, uh, I mean, the, the idea behind using adiabatic states was first to uh, decrease the computational cost of the problem because we are interested in the lowest electronic states. And therefore, we are using this minimization problem that leads to diagonalization of the electronic Hamiltonian. But since we are in high energy domain here, we don't need to minimize this energy and we can just bypass this diagonalization. However, in order to have a well uh, represented electronic state, we would like this state to adapt along the dynamics and then we want to make it time dependent. Uh, so basically we replace the big R dependence by a time dependence here. Uh, so here I just talked about uh, the electronic state, but we uh, shouldn't forget also about the nuclear degrees of freedom. In this very dense manifold of electronic state, we may have several electronic states that are crossing with many conical intersections. So first of all, you need electronic correlation to well represent all these interactions at the crossings or avoided crossings. And uh, furthermore, you have strong couplings between electrons and nuclei. And finally, you, as I shown you already, for example, with geometric phase, you may have quantum effects or also in the nuclear wave packets. So we have to keep all that in mind and uh, say that now we want a method that can account for all this correlation. And since I have a quantum dynamics background from the nuclei, the first method that came into my mind uh, when I thought about that was the multi-configuration time-dependent heart tree uh, method. And the idea behind MCTH is rather simple. It's uh, based on the stock of decomposition of tensors. And here I give uh, an example for the two particles uh, where we can represent this uh, electronic wave function in a tensor product basis here for two particles. And we have this um, uh, matrix with two indices here that is represented by this rectangular matrix. 
if some uh, of the coefficients here in this matrix are very close to zero because maybe they are associated to configurations that are very high in energy or very low in energy, then we would like to just not account for them and maybe find a procedure to automatically remove them. One way to do that is maybe a singular value decomposition and we end up with this much smaller A matrix that would contain the important uh, values here. And then we have also these matrices here that would uh, allow to go back to the original space. So now our wave function looks like this smaller matrix here. And uh, here we have now time dependent states. And each of these time dependent states is represented as a linear combination of uh, some time independent primitive functions. If we account now for the anti-symmetry uh, of the wave function, we need to add the f to mctdh. Uh, so it's basically mctd uh, r3foc. And this is uh, very similar to what uh, time dependent uh, complete active space method is doing. But here I am advocating in, uh, in the use of, uh, for the use of um, uh, MCTDH because with MCTDH you can have even more flexibility in the wave function. You can do uh, MCTDH in cascade somehow. Uh, so I am giving an example here on the four particle systems because this is when it starts to be uh, interesting. And uh, all that is called multi-layer MCTDH and it uses the hierarchical Tucker decomposition this time. So here we would have a four index tensor to deal with. And uh, if we want to avoid that, to reduce the dimensionality of the problem, we can still apply this uh, MCTDH method uh, on this representation. Uh, but now we would have time dependent functions that are in fact for two particles, each of them. But we end with here a matrix that has only two indices. So there is a gain here apparently, but everything looks like it's hidden in these time dependent functions. And each of these time dependent functions should be uh, representing the dynamics of two particles. So we need to use these free index tensors. They are this big part here, the free index tensors basically are these cuboids there and there. So with this uh, systematic uh, use of MCTDH recursively, we can uh, change our problem from uh, the need of uh, four index tensors to only tensors with two or three indices. And this is where we can have a huge gain. And that can be done uh, on two layers, like I shown here, but also on three, four, for many more particles. So it, it can lead three to very flexible wave functions uh, that can uh, be used to reduce the computational cost. Now we would like to add the anti-symmetry to these uh, wave functions. But since we have this separation that is kind of uh, artificial between particles that, that should be identical, uh, it's kind of difficult to just use uh, Slater determinants maybe or just uh, second quantization uh, when we are not in the Fox space, basically. So we have to move to the Fox space and use what we call the second quantized version of MLMCTDH. ML and this was done very recently at the end of the last year. So I would like to use this approach <clears throat> uh, for the electronic uh, wave packet. Uh, but let's go back to the problem of the nuclei and also the correlation between the electron and the nuclei, because this is where it can get also a bit uh, difficult. So we know that the nuclear wave packet should be uh, quantum, but we know that it's also slowly evolving on the time scale that we are interested in. So we can think that the wave packet will remain rather localized and we can use MCTDH quite efficiently to uh, represent this wave packet. For the electron nuclear correlation, uh, we have to think about uh, a way to hard code the, this correlation in the basis. And this is usually done uh, by the fact that the, um, the electronic basis, for example, atomic orbitals, are attached to the nuclei. So they will depend on the um, nuclear coordinates here, which means that our electronic states are not only time dependent, they are, but they are also parametrized by the nuclear coordinates. And then we go back to this, this problem that we have these large dimensional grids if we want really to, uh, to uh, represent this electronic state in the whole space. So we go back to the curse of the dimensionality with a uh, problem for the wave function expansion and numerical integration. Uh, furthermore, the action of the nuclear kinetic energy on the basis leads to second derivatives. 
Uh, but here it's not that much of a problem as for the adiabatic states because they don't go to infinity. Uh, how what I've been doing for low energy dynamics can help. Uh, so it, it does it in the following way. First, we use Gaussian trajectories uh, because we need it for the for applying the MCA trick. And this would work because the wave packet is rather localized in the nuclear space. And uh, then we apply this trick that we replace the nuclear degrees of freedom uh, that uh, parameterize the, um, the electronic states by the parameter uh, that is the center of the Gaussian. So it really, again, connect this electronic state to the corresponding Gaussian. And by doing so, we uh, avoid the dependence of nuclear degrees of freedom in the electronic state. And uh, we remove, for example, the second derivative. We also simplify all these integrals again, because this is just one uh, uh, multidimensional Gaussian integration. Uh, okay, so this is actually very recent work and uh, I will stop my presentation here uh, with the perspectives. I, I would like just to remind you that uh, this uh, version, this exact version of MCA uh, would lead to a method where only the finite basis approximation, uh, I mean, where only the finiteness of the basis is the approximation because all the matrix elements will be exactly obtained. Um, but all this matrix element needs to be implemented first. And there are many new of these uh, integrals. So this is a huge work that uh, we are going through right now. Uh, but the good thing is that uh, once you have this uh, method that is implemented, you can use that to devise approximations for all these integrals in a very controlled manner because you have the exact result at this position. Um, then, there is uh, also the fact that you can reuse all the integrals on the primitive basis for MCTDHF. So all this work would be transposable directly to uh, the simulation of um, uh, attosegon processes. And we can reuse all this machinery that was developed in quantum chemistry packages. We just need to interface it. So. And finally, uh, I talked about the automatic expansion of the basis, and this can also be done for the electronic part. This is uh, actually coming from paper, very recent by Hans Dieter Mayer. So I encourage you also, if you're interested in, in that, to, to look at this uh, paper. And I would like now to thank my collaborator at University uh, Gustav Eiffel, Alexander Mitrushinkov, and also my newly arrived PhD student, Rosa Maskri, uh, that uh, will work on this project. I also would like to thank the people in Toronto uh, for collaboration on MCA and also the work I've been doing with them on geometric phase. So Arthur Ismailov, Mina Assad, and Ilya Ryabinkin. And finally, I would like to thank uh, Fabien Gatti from Université Paris-Saclay uh, because I'm collaborating with him on these developments, including MCTDH. Uh, and I would like to thank you also for your attention. Thank you very much, Loic, for this uh, very detailed and uh, pedagogic uh, uh, presentation. So now we have uh, time for questions, and I see already one hand has been raised. Eva, you raised your hand. I think you wanted to ask a question. I just wanted to clap my hands. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Thanking for the nice talk. Okay. Okay. So it was not a question. No. Okay. Uh, are there uh, questions? <laughs> Let me check the list of uh, uh, to see if there are uh, hands over here. Hi. Uh, yeah, uh, Morgan Vacher, please ask your question. Yes, can you hear me fine? Yeah. Yes. Yes, again, okay, thank you, Loic, for this uh, very nice talk. I just had a question about uh, this uh, automatic extension of the basis. I mean, maybe you mentioned it, but maybe I missed it. Uh, can you say uh, a bit more about it? I mean, uh, you insisted on the fact that yeah. it was automatic, but I'm guessing you must have some threshold that you choose. Yeah, no? yeah you need um, threshold. So this, mu this must be benchmarked, uh, of course. Uh, so more work needs to be done in this direction. Uh, maybe I can say a few more words for the context for the people, uh, if they are not familiar with that. So they are automatic expansion, like multiple spawning. Also, there is the uh, cloning technique. Uh, but all these methods rely on um, a criteria that are only applied on the uh, local basis, basically. It doesn't account for the fact that there is a bunch of Gaussians that are uh, around. Uh, 
uh, with this new criteria that I call it variational, it basically uses all that to make sure that we are not uh, creating a new basis when it's not necessary. And basically the same work was done by uh, David Mendiv, uh, Tapia and Hans Dieter Meyer, but they did that in general for multi-layer MCTDH. Uh, and it's also variational. So just if I can give more con uh, context. Okay, so there's a difference in your approach that you take into account that there may be other bases around. Yeah. Uh, already can already pick up some population, exactly. uh, but you, you yeah you still have some threshold to yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you 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 need that yeah yes. so if if you don't design the threshold uh, optimally I would say you may over expand yeah way mm -hmm. more bases than what you actually need if you don't mm -hmm. do if you if you can also do the opposite way like yeah. if it's not sufficient you will not converge. Uh, fast enough and you may have to restart your calculation so it's it's very tricky still but this is uh, like uh, a bunch of tools that we have at our disposal and now we can act on the automatic expansion uh, at the level of the quantum classical trajectories uh, let's say with the uh, the multiple spawning or the multi configuration error interface with the cloning they are doing that already but we can also do it for the uh, solution of the um, the uh, quantum equation, I mean, the, the mm -hmm. Schrodinger equation. So it's on the level of the coefficients this time. So if we can play on both, maybe we can overspawn, but if we have a lot of trajectories in parallel, it's not really that of a problem. And then we can uh, like take what are the ones that are really important among all this, uh, uh, I would say ensemble of trajectories that we have using the variational criteria that was derived here. Mm -hmm. If it makes sense what I'm saying. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, there is a question from uh, Graham Worth. Please, Graham, open your microphone. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. hi, Loic. Yeah, you certainly um, looks like you're going to taking on quite a large amount of work to keep you busy for the next few years. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I just have a, a, a question um, a bit on the, 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 the sort of the basis of the MCA method that you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Because to me, uh, this this looks it's related to you know the exact factorization method of, of Hardy Gross and Federica Agostini. And people, uh, yeah? I mean, there are always connections, but yes. Uh, but what I was maybe wondering there was indicate I, me exactly what you think about. Well, I mean, it's the fact that your expansion. So you're expanding. You now have your. You basically have a, a if you like your time dependent electronic wave function. Yeah, which is sort of following. So you're sort of getting like a, a almost an air fest type surface yes because you could sum yeah. over those and you basically get the same ansatz but what i was wondering there was so in the exact factorization method because they have the coupling between the nuclear and the electronic parts it looks much the same and you then effectively have a non-adiabatic coupling that's experienced by the electronic part that they then in their sort of to, to make it useful throw away are you having to do something similar or are you really including you still have absolutely everything no, I have absolutely everything. So maybe I, I'm not I'm not sure which term exactly you are thinking about because I don't have all the equations in mind. Uh, I'm not an expert yeah, sure. exact factorization, but I can ensure you that here everything is included. No terms are throwing out okay. for some okay. reason. Um, there are non-adiabatic couplings that appear along the trajectory only. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am accounting for them, and it's because I have this time dependence here. I can come back here. I have this time dependence here to account for that is basically time derivative of the basis, and that mm -hmm. naturally leads to uh, the um, velocity uh, uh, scalar product with the um, uh, non diabetic coupling, if you uh, see what I mean. Not sure. Yeah, but that's, yeah, that's so, in the nuclear part. But this but... is the only place where the non diabetic coupling appears. Okay. Okay. I'll have, to, I'll have to look at that because I would assume that in the electronic part, you must have terms that are related like in an air and fest type approach because you've got that coupling there'll be terms driving the electrons from the nuclear momenta no as well yeah yeah the the yeah. only difference is like um the the multi configuration air and fest method that was uh, uh, developed is uh, still relying on the adiabatic representation to re-expand the wave packet maybe there is uh, like an intermediate diabatization but still okay. Uh, the, the initial form is the adiabatic representation. And here we just bypass it completely 
by going directly to this moving crude adiabatic representation. So you can think mm -hmm. that maybe the result would be the same, but the, the way is much uh, like shorter uh, to, to reach this point. Uh, and on the way, you are not dealing with all this um, diabetization, or approximation of the matrix elements and all these things. OK, OK. Yeah, thank you, Lloyd. Thank you. Ah, you're welcome. Well, I think we should move on. So uh, thank you, Loic, again for the for the presentation and for the discussion. Thank you. For so we move to the third speaker of, uh, of this session, uh, Elke uh, Fashauer from uh, Aarhus University. And she will speak about Fano meets nuclei, how nuclear degrees of freedom influence time resolve spectroscopy of electronic decay processes. So uh, Elke, please. Um... Hello. Um, and I would uh, also like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work. Um, and let me share the screen. Do you have the presentation now? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Well, um, we, we are obviously coming from very different backgrounds, but what we are all interested in is basically what happens during a chemical reaction and how can we monitor that? And in order to do that, we obviously need short pulses. But as you can see from this pulse, well, the, um, the, the pulse, is limited by the frequency of the mean photon energy because we cannot put less than one full cycle in our pulse. And that means that we have reasonably high energies if we want to go to very short pulses of several electron volts, well, many electron volts. And when these interact with the system, we create ionizations or excitations from inner, shell, from inner shells of these atoms or molecules. And if we want to extract time dependent information from that, well, we first look at what happens if we do that in the first place. They can decay, these systems can decay via electronic decay processes. And the best known of these is probably the Auger Meitner process, where you ionize from an inner shell, you fill the vacancy with an electron from a different shell, transfer the energy to a third electron, which you then ion, which you then emit, and you end up with a doubly charged um, unit and an electron. But there's also a different class of electronic decay processes where you ionize from the inner shell from one unit, you fill the vacancy with an electron from the same unit, and you transfer the energy to a second unit, which then gets ionized. So you end up with two singly positively charged units that repel each other and undergo Coulomb explosion. This is the interatomic decay process. What they have in common is that you have a rearrangement of your electronic structure and the emission of one electron. And we are going to have a closer look at the spectrum that you get from this electron. How do we as theoreticians get from this picturesque representation to a time resolved spectrum? Well, let's start with the time independent perspective. Yugo Fano um, proposed a theory where he used, where he described the wave function, the total wave function of the system as a superposition of bound-like states that we have, that we call R, and continuum states. And he didn't specify these wave functions further than saying that these are eigenstates of a common Hamiltonian. When we then take our system in the ground state here at the bottom left, 
Uh, we take a pulse with the mean photon energy of omega, we excite to the resonant state. This then couples to the continuum and decays under emission of an electron. Alternatively, we can also use the pulse to directly go to our final state that includes a free electron. The interference of these different pathways then gives us a very characteristic line shape, the so-called final profile, which is characterized by an, a parameter Q, which is basically the ratio between the um, excitation to the excitation probability to the um, resonance state at versus the transition to the, uh, the continuum state. And you see, well, depending on this Q parameter, you get a different minimum, a diff different minima, different maxima, and you get different peak intensities. What we can also co construct from this theory is the decay with gamma, which is given by the sum over the different decay channels of the uh, absolute square of this uh, matrix element. So we have a very effective um, description without actually necessarily uh, considering what these functions are. Well, let's look at the time dependent perspective of it. Theoretical and experimental approaches have uh, been able to both describe and measure the buildup of this final profile in time. Um, and if you wonder, these two experimental papers from, or collaborative papers from 2016 were really published back to back in the same journal. Um, and I'm going to show you that we with our theory get exactly the same shape. How do we do that? Well, the property we're interested in is the time and energy differential ionization probability, P that we have here. This basically gives us the probability to measure an electron of a certain kinetic energy at a specific uh, point in time. Well, then we want to know the, the amplitudes here. And for this, we need this, uh, this the time dependent Schrodinger equation to get our time dependent wave function. Well, we solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation um, by using first order time dependent perturbation theory. And very important, we here assume that our pulse intensity is low enough that we can still use the dipole approximation. When we do that, we get an expression for this amplitude up here that looks like that. What you can see is that we have three different terms. The direct term that I already described, the resonant term that I already showed at the beginning, and the indirect term. And we can understand what this indirect term is by reading from the right. So we start in our ground state G, we excite with our laser pulse to a continuum state. The continuum state evolves in time and couples to the resonance state, which then decays under emission of an electron. The interference of these three components then gives us the time resolved final profile. We posed an experiment last year and uh, for a different system, but very similarly, this was performed at the end of uh, last year experimentally. So we start um, not with an ionization, but with an inner shell excitation. Um, we fill the vacancy with an electron from the same unit, transfer the energy to a second unit, which then emits an electron. And this electron 
has an energy of roughly 5.3 electron volts. And as you can see, we have this very nice final profile. What we then also do, if we want to measure this, actually, you come with a second pulse. This is not supposed to be a strong field ionization, but rather a near infrared pulse. Um, we can use this pulse to remove this excited electron. And then we have the initial state of the ICD process, which then occurs and emits an electron of a different energy. But most important, it's a lower energy, which means we can by using different time intervals, um, create and measure this time result um, final profile. But we are having analytical effective functions. That means we can look at the basic properties without introducing any um, numerical or experimental errors. I mean, we have some assumptions, but um, we can look at the basic properties. And the first thing is at large times t. So basically after the decay happened. Um, and what we see here in the solid lines is that we get the final profile, but the not only the final profile, but the final profile folded with a Gaussian function, which is the Fourier transform of the time uh, envelope of our laser pulse. That means that the shorter the pulse is, so the lower the number of cycles in our pulse, the broader becomes the overall peak. What we can also see in this dashed line here is if we don't excite on resonance, so here I've um, taken a system with a different resonant energy. Then they, these two functions don't have their maximum at the same place. And that means that we basically damp this, this, final, pro, uh, this final profile. After shorter times t, we can look at different uh, values of Q. And what we see is the larger Q is, the smaller is the system. The larger Q is, the less pronounced is also the final profile because the larger Q becomes, the more this final profile evolves into a Lorentzian. You can see that from the interference terms and the relative contributions to the overall, overall signal. But what you also see at smaller times t is this oscillation in energy. And this oscillation in energy, we can analytically see, and it's proportional to this cosine function down here. But what you can see from this equation is, that there is not only an oscillation in energy, but also an oscillation in time. And indeed, that's what we find. This, um, this oscillation um, decreases over time. And we can analytically see that we have different terms that decrease with different exponential functions. So we have both this uh, exponential function over of uh, minus t over tau, and we have the, the different exponential functions uh, minus t over two tau. This first function will probably be dominant in the beginning and then be more or less decayed at larger times. Whereas the second one here, is dominant for the decay at larger times. But still, if we fit a function, and I've done that here for all maxima starting from the one after 300 femtoseconds, you will always underestimate the lifetime of your uh, system because you, will, you always will have a part that comes from the other term. And it's not only me who's observed that, 
But we've also seen that in this work for the autoionization of helium, the theoretical lifetime was 17 femtoseconds, but from the fit, they extracted 12 femtoseconds. Now, well, I've talked a lot about atoms, but what we're really interested in is molecules. So um, let's start with the dimer. When we look at the dimer, we can have our uh, pulse with a mean photon energy omega, with, which I have chosen to be the zero zero transition energy. I mean, I use model potential so I can do that. Um, but because I have a very broad laser pulse, I coherently excite several re vibrational or nuclear resonance states. And these can then decay to all the final states that are energetically accessible. Alternatively, we can uh, go to the final state directly and emit an electron with a certain kinetic energy. And the question is, how can we describe this theoretically? Well, we can in principle make the same ansatz, but we need the nuclear degrees of freedom. To be fair, Fan never um, restricted these wave functions to be only electronic, but let's try to um, disentangle this and um, explicitly formulate um, a product function of one resonance state and all bound nuclear states that this potential can uh, accomplish. So here we have the uh, bound state or the vibrational state of the resonance state. And here we have the vibrational eigenfunctions of the final state. In order to proceed with that, we need to determine these coefficients a lambda and b. And if we do that, well, we figure out that this is not as easy as one would have wished for. So we make a couple of approximations. One is that we use the bonn oppenheimer approximation. So we cannot describe conical intersections as we just heard in the talk before. And for the moment, we are restricting um, ourselves to cases where the resonance states do not couple via the continuum. And if we do that, we get an effective decay width um, for each and every resonant state um, where we basically weigh our electronic coupling parameters uh, with, the, um, with the nuclear wave functions and take the absolute square. And we get this, these lengthy uh, coefficients, which I won't discuss uh, in more detail. Uh, at the moment. Well, let's have a closer look at these effective decay widths. Well, usually you would either um, calculate the, um, the decay width of a system for, for different space, uh, places in R or different uh, geometries um, or just the equ equilibrium geometry. Um, and then if you wanted to get uh, more accurate numbers, you would perform a um, dynamic simulation. But um, I haven't tested this formulation yet, but um, it looks very promising that there is an easier way to, um, to go uh, further to get these decay widths. And of course, for different systems like the ICD, we would have an one over R to the six, dependence of the um, decay with, or for the OJ, we would probably have a proportionality um, that is exponential. 
But for this study, I will assume that the decay width is independent of the geometry. So let's go back to our time dependent formulation. We again look at the amplitude. And what we see here is that we again have a direct resonant and an indirect term, but we have this innocent looking sums at the beginning of the resonant and the indirect term. And that means that we can have many channels and they, the um, contributions to the wave function can interfere to get the, um, the signal in the end. What I would like you to focus on now is that we have these extra terms. So we have an overlap term for the resonance state and the uh, nuclear final state. And if we um, make the Conan approximation and take out this, uh, um, this dipole matrix element, we also get a Frank Condon factor here from the nuclear ground state into the um, nuclear resonance state. And here are some examples. I've used model potentials, Morse potentials with equal um, minimum um, distances. And I would like to show you some basic properties. Here on the left, you have the case of one bound resonance state and two bound final states. And what you see is you have two peaks, one here at 10 EV, that's the zero zero transition for all the spectra, the zero zero transition is chosen to appear at 10 EV of kinetic energy. And then you have a second peak down here. And let's compare it to the, the other one that is similar, which is for two bound states in the resonant state and one vibrational final state, where you also have the peak, the, the two peaks, one at 10 and one at a higher energy. And what you see is that you will get a rather complex uh, structure here which almost looks like an interference structure. But from the uh, analytical uh, formulation, we can see that this is not an interference pattern. This is just overlapping interference signals because of course, each of them is a final profile, which is an interference signal, but these are not interfering with each other. If we now look at the case over here to the right, I've chosen the two bound states uh, of the resonance state to be so close together that you cannot distinguish them. And what you see is, well, your fun, the fun profile is a bit blurry. And um, well, if you wanted to get the energy difference of these two um, vibrational states. You could in principle think, well, we have, if we look here, we basically have um, an interference between two resonant states. And from this, we can get the energy difference. But the beating of the interference spectra will give you exactly the same frequency. But what you can do is basically go a, look at a different energy than the maximum, um, analyze the frequencies by Fourier transforming, and then you will get the energy difference. If we look at the energies, um, we can also look at two different cases. So on the left here, we see the case where different numbers of bound vibrational states and one specific final state. You again see here that you have one principal peak 
and then you have one peak, the zero zero transition at the maximum, and then you have the other peaks along this curve, which are damped. What you also see, especially if you look at the orange curve where you have many resonant states, you see that these are not, uh, these don't have the same amplitudes. Also not if you consider the damping that is already included. And this is caused by the overlap integrals that I showed you. Because the overlap integrals between the different vibrational states, uh, well, they are, they, they are just completely different. But that also means that you get different effective Q values for each of these different, um, these different peaks. That also means that if you shift the potentials relative to each other, each shift will give you a new effective Q number and you can close and open channels by just moving the potentials without changing the energies. Then let's have a look at the right. Here we have one um, vibrational resonance state and different numbers of final states, nuclear final states. And here we don't see this pronounced Gaussian function. And the reason is that we have different numbers of final states. And each final state gives rise to a new function, which means that we effectively broaden our peak. And then there's another thing that is very nice that we can see here is that these overlap uh, integrals they don't ha necessarily have to be positive. And if one of them is negative, we can basically flip the peak that you see here. So to conclude, it seems I have a lot of time left, but well, we have a higher number of resonant and final states than in pure, uh, and pure electronic description at a reasonably small energy interval, which is clear because we are dealing with molecules. Then the overlap integrals weigh all the different contributions individually, and we get different effective Q parameters, which changes the line shape. Also, if we move the potential uh, energy surfaces with respect to each other, we can open and close uh, channels by affecting the, um, uh, the overlap integrals. Because we have been very clear in what approximations we include, included, that means that basic properties that will um, be seen in experiment or are seen in experiment can be analyzed and be attributed to exactly these approximations and thereby the physical effects that cause them. And what we see is that, uh, well, uh, I propose a new way to uh, correct the um, purely electronic decay with um, to include the nuclear effect of the wave function. And there are, of course, a couple of people that have contributed. And I, here I just uh, mentioned the uh, very few. So this is Lars Boyer Messen, uh, Matt Zimmermacher, who contributed with the, uh, some calculations, um, and uh, Marcel Mudrich and Christian Ott for some very helpful discussions. Um, and now I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Elke, for this uh, nice presentation, also for the pedagogy. Uh, uh, there is already a hand. Uh, uh, yeah, Alicia Palacios, please uh, ask your question. Uh, hi, uh, very nice talk, very well explained. 
thank you. But uh, I have just uh, a couple of questions. Well, one is more a remark, because uh, you keep pointing out uh, this Gaussian shape uh, form. Um, yes. Because you're looking at probabilities. But if you look at, uh, you define an effective cross-section, uh, they shouldn't depend at all on the pulse duration. I mean, uh, in the long time limit, the profiles they are plotting, they should look the same, exactly the same. In, in the one, this is a one photon process, no matter if you have a delay happening after. Uh, so that was the comment. And the question is, uh, did you, you, you use model potentials, but I'm wondering, did you take into account uh, the change of the nuclear mass? Because if you go to lighter and lighter atoms, you will see that these final profiles disappear. And as you go to heavier and heavier atoms, these final profiles are sharper. So did you take into account this or any comment about it? Um, I didn't include the, the, uh, the effect of the mass yet. This, these are really just model potentials, but that's a very interesting aspect to look at because I mean, that's very easy to include. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we have some work uh, on that. I mean, we can discuss later because that would be I'm really nice. curious to know in this model, well, this, uh, it's, it's a model, but it's quite an, a complex model. And I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure you will have this effect. That would be nice. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, more questions? I don't see, uh, I have also, uh, uh, I think, uh, could you show again the uh, slide in which uh, your answer, uh, your uh, extended uh, final answer in which you include the, yes. uh, the, the nuclear uh, wave functions? Yes. Because I, I have problems to digest that this can be uh, I mean, you, 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 you say that this is Bohr Oppenheimer. This is not Bohr Oppenheimer because you are, I mean, your Psi E there, you know, contains uh, different nuclear wave functions uh, multiplying the different uh, electronic uh, components. So uh, strictly speaking, you cannot, you are not factorizing the electronic part and the nuclear part. So I wouldn't call this uh, Bohr Oppenheimer. Uh, uh, Approximation. I, I I don't know. You would agree with this. I mean, you your 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 wave function has like let's say grosso modo two electronic components, okay, and each one is multiplied by a different a nuclear wave function. So which means that uh, well, this is not the Bohr-Oppenheim approximation. So it's just a matter of uh, language. Or or um, would you agree with this? Um, I am. Um... I'm not entirely sure that I understood your point yet. What I can see um, is that obviously, um, contrary to the one above, the, the original ansatz, the wave functions don't all have the same energy, but there is also a, form a formulation where that's not the case. Uh -huh. um, could you, so why do you again think that this I mean, is uh, more usually, than Oppenheimer uh, approximation? Yeah. Usually, uh, uh, well, people call Bohr Oppenheimer approximation to uh, when you write a wave function as a product of an electronic wave function and a nuclear wave function. Yes. But here, uh, you don't have, this is more complicated than that. I mean, you have an expansion over electronic states. A limited number of them, of course, because it's a is the final answer. Okay? Yes. And each one is multiplied by a nuclear wave function. So in some way, this expression uh, is very similar to the one we saw in the previous talk. Okay, uh, in which every electronic state was multiplied by you know a nuclear wave function. That's true. Yes. So, so in this sense, this is uh, this goes beyond the uh, the the normal Bohr-Oppenheimer approximation. So maybe what you mean by uh, Bohr-Oppenheimer is that you are neglecting in the in the equations that you write down later, you are probably neglecting non-adiabatic effects, as you said. So, yes. so you are, let's say, 
Okay. Uh, yeah. Applying your uh, uh, some way uh, an, adi an adiabatic picture. You are using an, an adiabatic picture, but you are not writing the wave function as a product of an electronic and nuclear wave function. You are going beyond that. That's true. Yes. So I think uh, uh, it's just a matter of language, but I think it's important. And I have uh, I see a, a hand. Uh, from uh, Nicola uh, Sisura, please. Uh, Just before that, um, what would you call it? Well, I mean, I, would, I don't know. I wouldn't call it Borgen I, I would, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, call it as you want, but it's not Borgen <laughs> Okay, so I have a child to be named. Yeah, no. Anyway, anyway, this was just a comment, and I see that there is a question by Nicola. Okay. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, great. Uh, just on your comment, Fernando, I think you're right. And in, in the context of final, they, I mean, this adiabatic approximation, they call it local approximation. Yeah. And so that, I think that's, that, that, that's right. It's in the later equation when you plug this uh, wave function into uh, the Schrodinger equation and so on. Then you neglect uh, some some uh, interaction. I mean, with some terms which are this adiabatic approximation, but we call it local approximation uh, in this context. Uh, I have also a question about. Uh, I mean, towards the end of the, the presentation, uh, Elke, you show the case where the two vibrational resonance uh, they overlap each other. But I think then isn't it that you answer? rely on the fact that they should be known interacting yes the answer relies on the fact that they are non-interacting but i mean you can still have energy differences that are that small that you cannot resolve um, it in the spectrum so but the question is does it i mean make sense to talk about just two uh, states i mean the whole theory should maybe break down or you have to add something else uh, I, i'm just wondering um well of course well i've of course included well not included the, the coupling via the um, the continuum but um what is the problem with having several states that lie so close together that you cannot resolve them in experiment no no it's 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 not uh, the problem of the experiment it's the problem of the on that if you if you start your uh, your equation saying that you should have only known uh, overlapping resonances, and then then you take this uh, limit case where they do uh, overlap, then then my question is uh, how correct is is that? That's a good question. Um... Well, this is this is probably not the. The, the most correct way to do it. I will have a look at that. In the, um, but, well, th well, that, as I already said, that's probably not the, um, the correct way, exactly the correct way to do it. But that's the approximation that I chose in order to get the first numbers and the first spectra. So this is, okay. of course, what I'm going to look at later. OK, thanks. OK, uh, I don't see any further question or comment. Uh, so I think uh, so first, I, I'd like to thank uh, Elke again for the for the presentation and for the discussion. And then I think uh, we can close the session almost in time. Uh, so I thank all the speakers for keeping uh, the time strict. And uh, so we resume the meeting at 1.30 uh, Central European time. And in the meantime, you can have lunch, but you can also meet the speakers in the uh, links that are indicated in the Atokem website. So if there are further discussions, questions, comments you want to make, this is a great place to do it. So thank you all of you for attending the talks and uh, see you at uh, 1.30.